there is a provision in, in the new uh, finance bill, some concessions for the old and disabled people, senior citizens. What are those concessions? There is a small change, not for senior citizens, but for those who've got a disability as defined under the Act. Uh, presently, the position is that if you take out an insurance policy and if the policy is, let's say, for 10 lakhs of rupees, then the premium that you can pay is only up to 10% of that amount. That means up to 1 lakh per year. If you pay a premium of less than 10% or up to 10%, then you get a deduction for the premium. And when you get the principal amount back on the maturity of the policy or on the, on, in the event of happening of the event, then there is no tax. But if a person pays more than 10% by way of an annual premium, in other words, you take a shorter term policy, then it's treated not as a genuine policy, but as a kind of measure of tax planning. And such, uh, you would not get a deduction if your premium is more than 10%, nor would you get an exemption in respect of the money that comes in at the end. But they've said that in respect of those who have a disability or a specified disease or an ail ailment, then your premium in any particular year can be up to 15% of the total sum assured and you will still get a deduction. Likewise, when the principal amount comes in or the maturity value or the assured value comes in, you do not have to pay tax. Therefore, in respect of those who have a disability or a specified disease or an ailment, this provision is changed such that the annual premium can go up to 15% of the total sum assured and is not restricted to 10%. However, for everyone else, it still remains at 10%. That is the change. How will this uh, rupees rebate will work out for the people in the bracket of uh, 2 to 5 lakh income? It may not make much difference to a person in that bracket, but let's assume that, the policy, that a person's income is between 2 lakhs and 5 lakhs. Let's say it's 5 lakhs of rupees. And if the person pays an insurance premium of, say, 75,000 rupees in a particular year, then if the person paying has a disability, he will get a deduction for 75,000. Oh, for the 2,000 rupees. Okay, it means, it means this, that uh, suppose a person has an income of 2 lakhs of rupees right now in the current year, he does not have to pay any tax. If he has an income of 2 lakhs and 20,000 rupees now in FY 12-13, then you have to pay tax of 2,000 rupees. In the coming year, if your income is 5 lakhs of rupees, then you will have to pay tax not on uh, the bracket of 2 lakhs to 5 lakhs, but from 220 to 5 lakhs. It means on 2 lakhs and 80,000 rupees, you will have to pay 10%, which means 28,000 rupees, as against 30,000 rupees. But if your income goes beyond 5 lakhs, hmm, then you will have to pay tax with reference to 2 lakhs onwards and not with reference to 2 lakhs 20 onwards. Quick question, Mr. Punamiya. Uh, can you please clarify about medical provision? You said uh, amounts paid to government. I think premium we are supposed to pay to government insurance companies or any private insurance companies for medical aid. No, government has certain type of schemes. And if you pay under those schemes to the government, it is also taken as a medical aid, whether it's central government scheme or state government scheme. Earlier this was not there. Now this year they say if you pay there, it will get it also. Ajay Gandhi scheme, they have come out some amendment. What is that? Can you just clarify? Shares in this material. Actually, um, there are two changes that they made to that. They, say, they had said last year that they want to encourage uh, persons who had not invested in the past to actually invest into the stock market. Of course, the stock market has been range-bound, so many people have not taken advantage of that. They have said that they are now making two amendments. One amendment is that not only shares, but you can also invest in mutual funds. That's the first thing. The second thing is very unclear because it says that you will get you can get a deduction over the next three years. Now, if your investment is only one in one year, how will you get a deduction over three years? Does that mean that you can invest in year one and separately in year two and separately in year three? That language is not clear. But the first part of it is clear that it will apply even to investment in, in mutual funds. And this is for first-time investors into the stock exchange.
or into mutual funds. But he is already invested in mutual fund. He won't be eligible for reduction. Looks like. Looks like he will not get okay. this deduction. Okay. For senior citizens, it uh, does it become 2.5 lakhs to 2.7 lakhs? Actually, the earlier senior citizen 2 lakh 50 thousand was the limit. Very senior citizen 5 lakh was the limit. So at least senior citizen, for example, I am a senior citizen. My income is 5 lakh of rupee. 250 is free. On remaining 250, I have to pay the tax, which may work out to say 27,000 rupee. So I don't have to pay 27,000 rupee. I have to pay only 25,000 rupee. So after working out the tax, I can deduct 2,000 rupee. And one question, you know, when I was entering, Sunil Bajaj asked me, a few members have asked him. I will just reply that also once I got the mic. Uh, up to how many years we have to maintain the books of accounts? You know, that was the question, 8 years, 16 years, 6 years. Actually, books of accounts is to be maintained for 8 years, but ITO can reopen only up to 6 years. He cannot travel beyond 6 years. To make it more clear, I will give you an example. If something is not available earlier to 6 years, also nothing worry, no problem. Because I remember when I was working with uh, Anil Haris, that time we had one client, Mr. Morarka. He was raided by income tax department. From his locker, cash of 20 lakh and jewelry of 20 lakh was found. Income tax department asked question to Mr. Murarka, what is the source of this? He said, sir, this is two numbers. Department said, okay, fine, two numbers, tax is the matter is clear. He said, tax is not going to be paid. Why not be paid? He said, I have earned this jewelry and cash six years back. I have not earned in last six years and you cannot travel beyond six years. So he said, prove it. He went to the bank, obtained a certificate from the bank that this jewelry was, he has not operated bank locker in last seven years. It means whatever he kept in a locker, it was kept six years back. Then department referred the, the, the jewelry, along with the jewelry, there was a valuation report. Report was sent to the income tax department and they sent, sent to Hyderabad and it was approved that the report is made six years back. They will return to RBI. RBI is certified, yes, currency was printed six years back and they could not do anything. So as far as income tax is concerned, department cannot do anything if six years have already passed. Sorry? Six assessment year excluding the current year. And one another question Sunil Bajaj asked me, ke how many gram in, at the time of raid, you know, income tax department used to take jewelry of the ladies, Mangal Sutra they used to remove, Bengal they used to remove. They say, what is this? still that same system is going on? No, things have improved a lot. Ten years back, government of the Internal Board of Direct SA issued one circular. A married woman can have gold ornament to the extent of 500 gram. Unmarried can have to the extent of 250 gram. Men can have to the extent of 100 gram. No question can be asked. It is perfectly treated as a valid. Neither they can take away, nor question can be asked. So this is also, so simplification is going on year by year. One question on which if you can explain a little further. You talked about this overseas dividends and uh, Mr. Harish was pointing out how it can be used to avoid tax. Would you explain that a little more in detail? You mentioned it, okay. but he was... So, uh, Ani, uh, it is like that. For example, I am a main uh, company in Bombay. I have a subsidiary company in Singapore. My holding in the Singapore company is more than 26%. So, that is my subsidiary. I am holding, that is subsidiary. The Singapore company declared the dividend. I get, because my holding share in the company, say 50% share, I will get the dividend here. But my holding must be more than 26%. And that dividend, if I pay tax in India, it will be at the rate of 15%. Then, of course, whatever TDS is deducted, that is a separate provision altogether. So, and once I pay 15% tax, then if I declare that amount as a dividend for my shareholder, I am the shareholder of that Singapore company, then I will get the money after paying the tax, whatever left over, I want to declare to my shareholder, then I don't have to pay dividend distribution tax, otherwise I am liable to pay dividend distribution tax. Anil, you want to add anything? I think this can be a very good provision in genuine cases because it enables money to come in so we get the benefit of foreign exchange and also some tax gets collected by the government. But the difficulty will arise in cases which are not really genuine where people have black money in India or outside India. What a person can do, let's assume a person has black money in India. He'll have it transferred out. He'll set up a company outside India, which is held by his, the shares of which are held by his Indian company. You know, now an Indian company can remit money out to set up a subsidiary. So 
he would set up an Indian company. The Indian company will have a paid up capital, let's say, of 5 lakhs of rupees. He will then remit out 5 lakhs and set up an overseas company. So the paid up capital is 5 lakhs over there. Then he will transfer his own black money, either which is in India or which is lying outside India, into that overseas entity. So now that overseas entity gets 10 crores of rupees. Suddenly it's done very well with a capital of 5 lakhs. is made 10 crores, just for example. It's set up in a place where there is no income tax, so that 10 crores doesn't suffer tax at all. That foreign company will then declare a dividend to the Indian company. There will only be 15% tax, so one, like 50, uh, so one and a half crores will go. This Indian company will then declare a dividend onward to its shareholder, the shareholder being the same person who set up the company. He will therefore get eight and a half crores in hand. So which means that his only tax has been 15%, which is much more than all of us pay. So I think this is something which can be misused a great deal. And this is a facility that is again only given for this one year, for financial year 13, 14. And I think it is probably motivated or is going to be used by some people who are ready for all this very quickly. Uh, an SSC has taxable income up to the year ending 2008. After that, the SSC has no taxable income. So she just writes a letter to the income tax that from here on, I will not be filing my tax returns. And the income tax doesn't bother to, uh, I mean, send any other intimation or anything. Is the uh, SSC on safe grounds to continue? Because even today, the SSC has no taxable income. 100% yes. Even you have not intimated, also in case of an individual, if income is below taxable, you are not supposed to file the return. But only in case of a partnership firm, in case of a company, whether there is income or no income, you have to file compulsory return. Otherwise, there is a penalty of 5,000 rupees. Individual HUF income is not taxable, don't have to worry. Can we take advantage of your presence today to ask you an update on what you said last year, which is the famous HSBC case. For one year, the government pretended that they were not doing anything. And we in Money Life knew otherwise, thanks to you. Now they say that notices actually have been sent. So what is the status of that? Nothing much happened for about a year. Then in the last month, the income tax department in different parts of the country began to send out identical notices, which means that there is some concerted action. They wrote to all the persons against whom there had been inquiries saying that we want you to give us an authority so that we can talk to HSBC directly and get information from them so that we can take action against you. Now, people have been receiving these notices in the last couple of weeks. Several of them have shown the notices to us and sent them, etc. They are all wondering what to do. Because one is that they could say, fine, go ahead and find out. We've got nothing to hide. But suppose there was something more than naturally questioned, etc. The accounts will be reopened for a long period of time. Although the normal a period for which there can be reopening, as Vimal mentioned just now, is six years from the end of the assessment year in relation to funds in India. Insofar as funds overseas is concerned, the period for reopening is 16 years from the end of the assessment year. That means, let's say, financial year 94-95 would have been assessment year 95-96. That got time barred on 31st March 2012. But what is open even right now is financial year 95-96. That means from 1st April 1995 onwards, your accounts outside India are still open to scrutiny. And therefore, if an ITO receives such a reply from an assessee saying, yes, I give you authority to be able to talk to the, the bank overseas, then the ITU could go up to 1st April 1995 and thereafter and examine the accounts. Now there are some practical difficulties that arise. One is that an SSE uh, may not really want to show that. That's a different issue. Suppose an SSE wants to cooperate. It could be that if he gives the authority to the, to the income tax department to inquire into those accounts, well, there may have been transactions at that time which do not necessarily reflect income because every deposit is not income. It could be a loan. It could be sale proceeds. For instance, suppose a person had bought some shares 
Hmm? Let's say he started off with $100,000. He, he invested that. He bought shares. And then he sold them later on for $110,000. Then he bought another lot of shares for $105,000 and kept $5,000 in the account and sold those for $115,000. It's not that every deposit constitutes income. It could be only the, it's only the profit, and there could have been a loss on some transactions, as many people, in fact, have done. So it's not just the total of the deposit side which will constitute the income. Now, if you give that authority to the income tax department, it could be that the ITO just takes the total of all the investments and says, I want, you to tax, I want to tax you on this amount, which is not necessarily the correct thing. Secondly, an SSE may not have the information from 1995, 96 onwards, which is, again, another practical possibility. So these things are going to arise. Now, if an SSE says, well, I'm not going to give you this authority, then there's suspicion that he's trying to conceal it. But another situation which we've actually found in practice is this, that there was an overseas trust, and the trust had, had an account in HSBC Bank, actual case. Hmm? One of the beneficiaries has now become resident of India, and another beneficiary is still non-resident. So if the resident beneficiary tells the income tax department, I don't mind if you have access to that account, the non-resident beneficiary may say, I do mind. Or the trustee may say, I do mind, because it's my duty to look after not only the person who's become resident of India, but also the one who is non-resident of India. So where do you draw the line? If the SSE, Indian SSE says, I don't mind, go and look at those accounts, then the other ones can object. Will that then be a presumption of guilt that is drawn against the Indian resident? It could be, because the ITU may say that you have said yes, knowing that the others are going to say no. But the others may be saying no in their own interest. So there are these difficulties. But more than that, the real difficulty I find is that so far there is no clarity whatsoever from the income tax department on how this money is actually going to be brought to tax. The normal system of taxation is that it is on a financial year basis. Whatever income you earn in financial year 12, 13 has to be taxed in this year, 11, 12 in that year, 10, 11 in that year, etc. And your tax, interest, penalty, etc. will follow based on the year and the rates applicable in those years. But even though a year and a half or so have passed since the accounts were being opened, the income tax department has not said how they're going to tax it. They just called people and said, okay, we are raiding you or we are, we've uh, sent a notice to you. Now you declare one crore, 2.4 million, or whatever you're declaring. So you declare that. But how is it going to be taxed? What about the interest on that? When is the assessment going to be completed? Is it going to be taxed in the year in which you made the declaration? Is it going to be taxed in all those different years? Are they actually going to send notices for reopening? What will be the procedure? How much time would it take? What what if you cannot answer the questions and show actually how much your income was for want of information? All these things are still open. I wish there were clarity on this because we must not presume that everyone just wants to evade tax. Yes, people do evade tax, but there are also many who, having evaded tax, do want to be able to declare it now and really close the matter once and for all. And that's something that can be good for the government and good for the SSE because it frees their mind. So that's not happening. It's in the interest of everyone that there should be clarity. If you want to charge a penalty, by all means do so. But do it now. Why should you wait for 10 years to do that? Maybe they should ask Arvind Kejriwal how, what is an acceptable way to treat it? Maybe, maybe we need a solution, <laughs> not a postponement of a solution. Yeah. Absolutely. I think most Money Life members have finished asking questions. So anybody else wants to ask, the floor is open to you. One there. Uh, I have a question about income tax when you sell property. Uh, the first question is, uh, if there's a joint holder, for example, I am the, uh, my, mine is the first name and my mother's is the second name, are both uh, liable to pay tax or is it just the first holder? And the second part of the question is, uh, in the same situation, I'm the first holder, my mother's the second holder. If I want to, before I sell the property, I want to get out of any tax liability. So, if my mother's name wasn't on it already, I could have gifted it to her. But since she's already a second holder, is there a way to uh, surrender away my rights or whatever so that it becomes entirely in her name? Thank you. 
income tax point of view, person who make the payment is the real owner. For example, you and your mother jointly have purchased and mother name is first, your name is second. And mother has paid 100%, she is the owner, your name is only associate member, sake of convenience. If both have paid the money, both are the owner. Then both are liable to pay 50-50 on the proportion what you have paid. Now let us assume the situation, second question. You have paid 50%, mother has paid 50%. So legally both are the owner, but you want to remove your name. Then you have to give gift of your share, half, to mother. Or for example, mother want to give to you, mother will give gift to you. It is relationship, blood relationship. So stamp duty will be applicable at the rate of 2%. Registration fees will be there, 1% or 30,000, whichever is lower. So we assume that property value will be more than 30 lakhs. So let us say it is 50 lakh rupee. Then 1 lakh rupee by way of stamp duty, 2%. 30,000 rupee registration fees. And it will be on a market value, not your cost value. Today, whatever the market value, a building is old. Let us say a building is 34 year old. You get rebate of 40% depending upon life of a building. It may be depending upon floor, employed may be on higher floor, then certain percentage to be added. And whatever ready director value come finally. 2% stamp duty, 30,000 rupee registration fees, and your right will come to an end, mother will be 100%. Then mother, or mother give to, give to you, then you will be the owner. I can give even, even though she's already the head, give just my part of the Exactly, head. correct, correct. Thank you. Sir, about that uh, defect, uh, when the return is filed without the payment of tax, that will be... Retrospective effect or a prospective? No, prospective, prospective. prospective. Normally income tax, may once in a while, retrospective effect come. But normally whenever amendment is there and it is charging in, uh, if they want to charge something to a citizen, it is a normally prospective. Till it is specifically written, it is retrospective. And when they want to give benefit to the SSC, it normally comes retrospective, prospective. Sometimes procedural changes, then that apply to retrospective also. But this um, particular amendment, I feel, will be prospective. Prospective. So, uh, till uh, 31st March 2013, if you not paid, no problem. But when you file return for 31st March 2014, it has to be paid. Thanks. Just a small question. Like when you, in this case, when you are selling the property to your parent, let's say mother. Selling or gift? Or, or gift. gift. But, and you then said market value. Yes. Now, does the market value recognize that it's half a property? Yes. With the sitting tenant, effectively? Sitting we tenant formula is completely different. Okay. There you different formula, 112 month rent what you are getting. What is the 150, uh, 112 month rent plus certain one or two minus point or further is to be added and uh, ownership for example there is a flat having vacant possession. Market value may be 5 crore rupee. But if there is some tenant is sitting and paying rent of only 1000 rupee per month, the value will be not more than 5 lakh crore rupee. But you have to prove three, four things. He is the tenant paying rent, ration card, election card, pen card, passport or some three, four evidences out of seven, eight. So, just to prove that he is a real tenant, it should not happen that simply I create tenancy today and I say he is my tenant and I pay only discounted value. Otherwise, that, that tenancy formula is completely different. Under 12 month rent and some about 3 4 items to be added. That's all. Minor addition here and there. Uh, so, actually, I had a question. The question is uh, it is for service tax related to restaurants. Uh, is service tax charged on the service charges or is it on the entire food bill? Entire amount, but food may some concession is given. So individually one has to study, but otherwise whatever amount you are paying, it is on entire. And then whatever food, there are certain percentages there. Okay. Like so builder, you know, builder also, for example, I am a builder. I sell my flat to you in one crore rupee. Service tax here at the rate of 12%. But what happen? I am buying land, I am buying cement, there I am paying excise. I buying uh, metal, there I am paying uh, another excise duty. So I have, you, I have option, either I collect 12% from you, deduct all the amount and pay balance to the government or I don't claim anything my set off and instead I collect only 3% from you. Uh, I get set off of 75% and 3% I collect. So here whatever impute, whatever service tax is paid, that set off will be given. Some, here, some places they gave certain percentage. So don't have to go in a detail. Okay, whatever you collected this much, this much is the rebate, balance you pay. And sir, one more question was, uh, generally, when I see in, the, in restaurants, every restaurant have different uh, percentage of service tax. So what is the reason of, for that? Service tax or service charges? Uh, service tax. Service tax. So I think percentage should be same. I don't think they can charge different, different. Service charges, yes. They give distribute to, the tips are given to waiters. They sometimes charge, charge 12%, somebody charge 15%, somebody charge 10%. But service tax has to be uh, fixed for everywhere. <coughs> Then individual view to see actually, the individual view to see. 
Sir, in case if I uh, inherit property through because of a will which was made by my mother or whatever, in that case, what happens? And if a child inherits property, then what happens? I mean, what is the tax? In case of an inheritance of property, no income tax, no stamp duty, no registration come in the picture. You don't have to pay anything. Okay. Only if society nomination is filed in the society, it is binding on society to transfer. But let us assume nomination is not filed. Society is doubtful that there may be some litigation, then one has to obtain the probate and some probate fees is to be paid. Otherwise, it is a not transfer, it is a transmission. In case of a transmission, no tax come in the picture. Okay. Inheritance of property, on the contrary, concession has been given. Let us take example, my father has made a will in favor of four brother. My father has left one property, say let us assume the market value of the property is one crore. And if four brother get 25 dollars like each. Now we three brother don't want, we want to give to our fourth brother. So we three brother can release in favor of a fourth brother by paying 200 rupees stamp duty and 100 rupees registration fees. So a lot of concession has been given because it is not a transfer, it is a transmission. And anything happened because of a nature, death is in the hand of God. Of course one person is born, death is certain. But it is not in the hand of a person, it is in the hand of a God. So it is a transmission and no tax come. I would like to ask uh, if uh, one has a property, and uh, the society is not uh, and the society is not at all uh, registered then what is the status of nomination in that i mean can i nominate or uh, if i don't nominate what will happen to the transmission of the property you can make a bill as per the bill by the time the society is formed and uh, because you know there are three four situations if nomination is filed then of course there is no problem but there is no society so nomination cannot be filed you can write letter a builder may not recognize. So one can make a will and even there is no will. Let us assume the society form after two years. At that time no nomination is there. If will is there, you file with the indemnity bond, a letter of other declaration and society will transfer if they are known to you. But if society may feel that there may be litigation then of course you have to obtain a probate. Let us take the situation the person not made even will also. No nomination, no will. Then also, for example, I am a secretary of the building. One lady come to my flat, he say, well, my husband passed away, you transfer flat in my name. I got, I can do, I take her application, keep on notice board for one month, any member have any objection can write to me. There is a prescribed format in all Maharashtra Corporate Society Act. And then, so nobody raise objection, I give advertisement in two newspaper, Marathi and English, maybe in ordinary newspaper, then no objection received, I take indemnity bond from that lady, or son or daughter or whatever. If other relatives are there, then I take consent from them. Maybe they have not objection and property can be transferred. I have one last question for both the speakers. You said the budget was a lost opportunity. We could have done so much more. Overall in your assessment, in maybe one sentence, what would you say? Was it good? Was it neutral? Did it do nothing? Or he had some positive things to say about e-filing. Can I request both of you? In my view, it was a good budget. Finance minister could not do better than this because our exports are increasing, import is decreasing, foreign exchange is reducing, income tax collection has gone down by 30% and still did not levied any tax. So I personally feel it is a good budget, but I still feel, if Sucheta does not agree with me, government must come with some scheme, person who is not paid income tax in last 5-6 years, not filed a return, they must give opportunity to that person so he can pay voluntarily. Our country has 120 crore population. Department cannot take any action on, on even more than income tax rate had taken place last year on 39 parties. Before that 45 parties, which was there 5,000, 10,000, 20 years back. So government cannot take any action. Because recently even internal circular says, internal after investigation, for example some information come to department. They feel that Mr. A has got a lot of black money. They have to do one month homework. Three officers will be on the job. After the homework report will be prepared. In report it is found that by rating the particular person we can get 100 crore rupee unaccounted outside books of accounts. Then only rate is authorized. Otherwise rate cannot be authorized. So how many client person have more than 100 crore? Sometimes voluntarily somebody want to pay taxes to the government, he must be allowed to do that. So government get the tax. So I personally feel I will give 9 number out of 10. I wish they would say at least one year those who have paid diligently will get a holiday at the same time. <laughs> The budget consists of two parts, the revenue, the expenditure, and the income, the revenue. 
in so far as the expenditure is concerned well that's the allocation between the different ministries and for the different projects etc today we are not really discussing that we were more concerned with the revenue and within the revenue the direct taxes not the indirect taxes that's what was the subject matter of today's discussion and that's the the part that i uh, study in so far as the direct taxes are concerned i think that I'm not worried about this rate of tax going up by 3%. That's not significant. We've all paid tax at much higher rates. So whether you pay a 30.9 or 33.99 is not very significant. We can all afford to do that. But what? Uh, but I think it was not a necessary thing to do. In fact, history has shown that whenever the tax rates have gone down, the collection has been much more. So I think that was a lost opportunity in so far as that is concerned, but not very significant one way or the other. What I don't like is these different procedures and just making things complicated. Look at the surcharge. On this category, there's a 0% surcharge. Then on this category, there's a 10% surcharge. Somewhere there's a 5% surcharge. For foreign companies, it's 2%. Somewhere else is 5%. These, these are the things which are just unnecessarily complicated, which make life difficult for all of us. And ours is a country which has been very poor. There's, education is not spread to everyone. Today, for instance, I got a notice today. My father passed away 15 years ago. Today I got a notice saying that profession tax has not been paid from 2004-05 up to today. The amount is 40,000 rupees for these few years. Now we wrote to the profession tax department in the year 1998, uh, when my father passed away. And we did not obviously pay for all those years after that. Even if they were to look at the records, they'll find that he had paid for so many years before that, you know, for 40 years or so. So obviously a person will have reached the level of senior citizen where he's not liable to pay. But when you get a notice after 15 years, you may get it from profession tax, you may get it from service tax, you may get it from VAT, you may get it from income tax, you may get it from the other department of income tax, namely the TAN. You just find that there are so many complexities. Now you do have to replace apply to each of these things. We are educated, we understand the importance of accounts and maintaining of records. We know that we have to keep accounts and records for so many years. Everyone is not in a position to do that. Everyone doesn't have the people to help them. And therefore, how will a person now be able to take out that letter, well, I informed you in 1998. Or if a person can't even read English or can't read the language in which the notice has been sent. How does he reply to it? And when he gets numerous ones, or he doesn't have space in his house or office because space is so very expensive, he can't maintain all those records. He thinks, well, my father passed away. I don't have to keep those records anymore. And this is, but he has to reply. A lady came to me who is over 70 now. She was a doctor. She studied in Bombay. She was enrolled as a doctor in Bombay, but she did not work in Bombay for even one day. She went abroad, and she was working abroad. She worked for 30, 40 years, or 50 years, or whatever. She came back to India 10 years ago. And she's still getting notices from the profession tax department. She lives in Pune, but because she studied in Bombay, she gets it from the Bombay department. So she comes to Bombay to reply, because when she sends a letter, she doesn't get a reply. Then she talks to me, and I send someone over there, and we give a letter, and then again, she gets another reply. They've not taken note of all these things. And so this goes on and on. And this has been going on in her case for 10, 15 years. I don't know for how many more years it's going to go, go on in my father's case. This is what we need to simplify. So I'm not worried about the tax, but I'm just worried about the attitude, the bureaucratic attitude that there is. And in fact, even in this morning's papers, there was an item saying that the finance minister said, I had not read the provisions correctly or I had not read the provisions properly. Therefore, I find that there is lack of clarity. Well, it's his duty to read every provision. He is the finance minister and he's a lawyer to boot. So you should have read every word as we read. In one day we read the provisions and we can't be able to explain in detail. Of course, he's got many more things to do. He has to look at income tax and, and service tax and VAT and wealth tax and, and excise duty and so on. But it's still his duty to read everything. He cannot say that there's lack of clarity and see how much impact it has on all of us. So my objection is not to the rates of tax. My objection is to the manner in which this administration is being done and the fact that there are so many provisions which have lack of clarity and which are going to result in disputes, which disputes will go on for the next 10 and 20 years and blight our lives completely.
Thank you very much for another wonderful session, uh, Mr. Anil Harish and Mr. Vimal Punimia. Can we give them both a big hand, please?